to introduce Carl Oliveri, our partner at Grassi, to discuss constructing the new normal. Good day and thank you for joining us. I'm pleased to be here with you all virtually and hope everyone and your loved ones are healthy. Looking back to 2019 and even the early months of 2020, today's United States construction industry almost looks unrecognizable. Construction spending was at an all-time high, the industry was, new, was near full employment, and floor space was tough to come by. But then the unimaginable happened, a global pandemic that was deemed unprecedented. This is a word that has become commonplace and one we don't use often because of its connotation. It's not very often that we experience something that has never been seen before, but that's exactly what the COVID-19 pandemic has been. It is unlike any other crisis that we have faced in that it has affected every business, no matter the size, every industry around the world by forcing them to rethink how they deliver their goods and services and how we're going to keep our most important asset, our people, safe and healthy. Looking at 2020, it is remarkable to see the quick pivoting strategies and innovations that the construction industry implemented to continue to build and help guide the worldwide economy through the thick of the pandemic towards and into recovery, all with the end game of staying open, keeping our people again healthy and safe. In the United States, foreign concepts and terms in how we conduct the everyday, everyday business, such as the Paycheck Protection Program, socially distanced job sites, sanitation and job cleanliness protocols, COVID-19 response plans and on-site medical professionals, this all became commonplace in how we executed on projects. There's been no greater challenge over the past year than how to build in the COVID-19 era, and we succeeded. So as we look ahead to the rest of 2021, into 2022 and beyond, the question becomes, how do we construct in this new normal? Lynette, you and I have spent a lot of time talking about our respective geographies across the world. Can you give me your regional perspective on the impact of the COVID pandemic on the construction and infrastructure sectors in the SSA? Uh, thank you so much, Carl, um, for that, firstly, that um, context that you've provided as we begin this conversation, but um, also for the question. Um, it's been really interesting um, through this pandemic to firstly note that for perhaps the first time in a very long time, the world has found itself with a common challenge and a common problem, um, which has been fighting this biological crisis that for whatever reason, we all didn't quite factor into any of our business continuity planning um, or any of our crisis management strategy. Needless um, to say, our geographical differences means that COVID-19, just dependent, I guess, on the progress your society has made, the access to infrastructure, capital, resources, skills even, has had different repercussions um, the world over. In the, South, um, in the sub-Saharan region of Africa, I think, you know, perhaps the biggest impact on um, construction and infrastructure moving into the pandemic itself was, firstly, the pandemic has highlighted some of the very serious deficiencies in our provision of infrastructure, um, particularly infrastructure for public good. If you're sitting in sub-Saharan Africa, you think, hey, what does America further need in terms of its development? Is there truly a need? Um, but perhaps you can um, go um, into the details around what this really means. Yeah. So, um, you know, first, I guess, you know, let me let me define what I consider infrastructure. And I think it's very much in line with you. It's, a, it's anything construction related that's for the public good. Energy, roads, uh, water. Um, you know, there's there's been a much publicized infrastructure spending bill in Washington, D.C., which um, definitely does not cap it captures all these items, but then uh, a couple other items that one would argue is not technically infrastructure. So, um, let me caveat with, with my, my definition of infrastructure is, is roads, rails, and again, same same thing with the, with the with the SSA. Anything that's really going to be for public good. So, to answer your question, when I'm asked what non-financial guidance I'm going to provide to a construction company, I always advise them. You got to be in tune with the current marketplace and what trends are happening there, but always, always, always keep an eye on Washington, D.C. from a legislative and infrastructure perspective, right? So the short answer to your question is yes, there needs to be an infrastructure spending bill. It is real. We need it. Um, first and foremost, 
it is the easiest way to create jobs. Um, we're going to see here in the states the end of certain federal programs designed to support workers that were laid off as a result of the pandemic. Um, and if you kind of couple that back and go look at any other major financial crisis that the United States has experienced, the Great Depression, the Great Recession uh, from, from about 10 years ago, the construction industry always, always, always leads the way in terms of recovery. The reason being, it's easy to create jobs in there, and these jobs always result in highly visible projects. So we see the efforts of our government spending translating into, into those jobs. The disarray and disrepair of the United States infrastructure has been well documented and discussed over the years. Um, there was a recent report from the American Society of Civil Engineers that stated the U.S. will be underinvested, underinvested in the infrastructure by an estimated two trillion dollars with a T by the time we reach 2025. So, as a worldwide leader um, in, in business. Um, in, 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 um, in medical and in, in everything we do in the United States, our infrastructure is going to be underinvested by $2 trillion. That's a big number, and that's something I really want to, to, to have everybody to think about and let that sink in there. In terms of funds that are spent on roads, bridges, water systems, and other infrastructure, this report cites that that fell by 8% between 2003, 2003 rather, and 2017. Now, 8% over that, that, that period of time doesn't sound like a big number, but when we're talking about billions and trillions of dollars, 8% does average out to a, to, to a sizable figure. My concern here is the reality is that employers are looking to bring people back to the offices. Mm. The work from the remote, it was great. It kept us going, but nothing's ever going to beat that one-on-one -on -one interaction. So as our employers look to bring people back into major cities, the question becomes, can the existing infrastructure, which was already in disarray, handle this type of demand again? Mm. It's another year where it's gotten older. So what happens to it? It continues to deteriorate. And the other piece of this is the failure to maintain the infrastructure. It's going to make it difficult for that to recover from unexpected acts of nature. We've been hit with a few hurricanes over the past few years, Hurricane Sandy being the most notable. Um, we're still repairing our infrastructure as a result of that hurricane which was close to 10 years ago. Could you share with me some of the details about the changing pace and priorities of the capital spent in the built environment where you are? You, you know, it's quite interesting that I've been nodding fervently, you know, as you've been responding, because exactly the things um, that you are faced with in a big city like New York, um, if you move to the African continent, it's the exact same challenges that an individual or a business that operates, um, whether it's a fleet or your own individual car, faces um, in Lagos, in Nairobi, um, in Kinshasa or in Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, and it's simply just how does our public sector and those institutions really ramp up the rate and the speed at which they are able to become responsive to the type of demand that firstly we've placed already on our infrastructure, but now the new demands that we're going to have on the same infrastructure, if not more. I think, you know, with us, some of the, the, the big um, changing priority, uh, priorities, um, if you look at the African um, context at this point in time, and I love that you touched on it, was um, the interface of technology and infrastructure related to technology into infrastructure. We've typically always separated the two whereas they are so closely um, intertwined, um, whether it's telecoms, um, you know, it's technology that enables trade and um, business to continue, education to continue, and even different systems um, to connect to one another. And, um, you know, the African continent has significantly lagged behind in that particular space and realm. Um, when we look at the numbers um, just in terms of, access to connectivity on the African continent. It's dizzying to think that um, most people on the African continent have access to a phone and a SIM card. On average, the average African person over the age of 16 has access to two or three SIM cards and or units, um, but on those units does not always have access to connectivity. It's again, we're, 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 we're geographies apart, but a lot of the same challenges and same opportunities, you know, healthcare, 
schools, education. Fo the focus is on the, those facilities leading the way um, to modernize those facilities, um, to, to, to make the conducive to in-person learning, obviously, in-person medical treatment as well. Um, you know, when you, your comment about everyone just kind of pivoting and being at home, the opportunity there with the e-commerce um, to see more and more data and um, uh, distribution warehouses popping up, which, which you know, we'll touch upon shortly. Um, but, you know, I wanted you to, to ask you to follow up on, on everything you just shared with us. And in, in light of what you're seeing in your region, how are you dealing with redundant, condemned, vacant space from the public and private, from the public and private sector's perspective? Sure. From a public sector perspective, um, Carl, there has not been no plan. And, um, you know, as a practitioner in the space, um, it's perhaps been the saddest, um, you know, position to be in where, because there's so much red tape, there's so much bureaucracy. On the other hand, in the private sector, it's been really, really interesting to see that initially there was a great fright, particularly if you look at our commercial um, and retail um, sector in terms of, okay, let's write it out and see what's going to happen. But I think as reality also begins to dawn and set in for many of the participants in that particular space, creativity is also the green shoot um, of the crisis that those two um, classes in the sector um, have been tasked with. And so you're seeing the repurposing of commercial space into um, shared um, public facilities for small business. Um, you're seeing hotels being moved into sort of middle income housing. You're beginning to see, um, you know, us addressing long-standing issues um, around um, student accommodation, for instance. Through now the existing vacant spaces, we are beginning to see us use empty offices and starting to say, hey, how can we convert those into business process um, outsource centers, call centers, um, and industrial spaces that are now taking into account, um, you know, infrastructure. You know, before the pandemic, um, the likes of the Amazons, the, the, the likes of the very big um, global career and door-to-door -door service delivery companies was something, you know, we, we knew of, and you probably only had about 5 to 8% of the populace across the continent using on a regular basis. Um, but come the pandemic, it means even the local players as well as the global players suddenly need to really cement their presence in the region. And cementing their presence in the region also requires infrastructure. I'm interested in hearing from your perspective on some of the really um, interesting proactive strategies um, that you've advised clients on um, to undertake um, as they look at the value, the position, the sustainability of their portfolios and assets um, as, as they come out of this pandemic. Um, what have you been advising? What do you see changing on the scene and the direction that everybody's taking? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great conversation in itself. Um, I think so many people got focused on the hurt and the financial pain caused by COVID-19 that they didn't see the opportunities in the practice improvement areas uh, that, that, that could have been, and in some cases that were had. That, that being said, I think three of the focal points as we construct the new normal for U.S.-based construction should revolve um, around some financial and some operational concepts as well. You know, the first thing is, Always make sure you have a fluid cash flow model and operating budget in place. Best practice, six to 24 month coverage period. Um, and the reason we want to have this model in place is because we know contractors can fail in good times due to financial constraints. Now put them in a time of financial and health crisis and you're just adding some more gunpowder to that keg right here. Utilizing tried and true financial management planning tools, such as project centric cash flows and budgets it's going to let the contractor identify where projects will experience cash surpluses or deficits and understand how that's going to impact the entire company uh, from the CEO down to the, to, to the apprentice level laborer. Um, the power here is that when you find a constrained period, you're going to be able to take the necessary steps proactively to identify where you're going to have to have a new source of cash flow to carry the operations until that, that position reverses itself. 
The second area I'm really advising contractors to focus on is do not take work for the sake of taking work. Don't take work to keep the field busy. Backlog's burning off here at a rapid pace, and the replacement work is not as readily available as it was a year ago, um, or two years ago for that matter. So while there are needs for a few new projects to mobilize across all sectors of the economy, the uncertainty caused by the COVID-19 pandemic has really slowed down the funding and, and the number of new projects coming out there, contrary to what's been reported to the media. You know, again, work is still coming out. What's happening is, especially in the public infrastructure side of things, we're seeing more and more bidders in the pool. And what's happening is when we have more bidders in the pool is they're aggressively pricing these projects at slim to no margins just to win work, just to put a project on the books to keep their good laborers busy. The problem is this is going to have a negative impact in the future. It's unsustainable. It's going to lead to cash flow issues, and it could have a waterfall impact in impacting subcontractors, um, laborers who may lose their pro lose their positions, um, advisory and ancillary firms as well. So to that extent, if a savvy construction company can bid work to make money, even if at a lower project profit, stay within his or her expertise, they should look to see where they can reduce overhead and conserve corporate capital while remaining competitive. Um, the last kind of action item I'm, I'm talking to contractors about is Really look at your income tax options and develop the strategy. We do have an expectation that President Biden's going to reform the United States tax structure sometimes in, in 2022, if not sooner. What this does is it throws a twist into income tax planning. We typically want to create income tax deferrals. It's an efficient way to create corporate capital and um, help a company fund itself while requisitions are being funded. To avoid a lengthy dip in your line of credit um, and, and have ownership of these additional capital. While we're in this wait and see for where President Biden will take income taxes in future years, we do know what the income tax rates are for 2020. We have an idea where they're going to be for 2021. So, after consulting with your tax advisor, if you as a construction company believe rates are going to increase in the future, well, the notion of accelerating income becomes a viable tax planning strategy, which can save some future cash flows. So a little, little, little bit of uh, counterintuitive advice when it comes to income taxes. Pay it now when rates, when you know what the rates are, rather than hoping in the future rates stay consistent. And as we know with any industry, especially construction, cash is king and hope is not a strategy. So, you know, Lynette, I'm sure you're seeing some interesting strategies across your construction base as well. Um, in the States, I'm seeing construction contractors start to adopt technologies that may have been a year or two out. And really, that was a function of the pandemic. Have you seen more contractors in your region adopting new technologies, shift to the hybrid occupation space? Um, what, do, what do you think the impact of all this is going to be on uh, to the on-built environment? Um, so what we've definitely seen is um, the shift to the hybrid occupational space I think for particularly the large corporations and the larger contractors that had this sort of in their business continuity plans has been a far easier and a better managed um, process. Um, and I think from that perspective, it's also helped them forecast what is required um, and what um, also what does this new normal look like and what do they repurpose, what do they dispose of? Um, and what capacity is then open to do different things um, as they now move into new strategic horizons, but also starting to now appreciate just some of the consequences that are here to stay from the seismic changes that the pandemic has brought about. Um, technology in the built environment, interestingly enough, um, you know, if we talk about um, Cretech and we talk about PropTech in the sub-Saharan African region, um, really probably began to gain, gain some traction only in the last 18 months or so. So just before the pandemic struck, um, we began to have far more formalized, far more, um, you know, incisive discussions and conversations about how do you integrate technology, not just into your building management um, or management of different utilities and facilities, but also how do you actually integrate it into areas like um, 
design and um, areas like the actual construction and project management process as well. And just better use that, you know, to get and accrue efficiencies, um, manage projects be better and the like. And so it was a very new conversation. And so it was, of course, then the pandemic strikes and, you know, we left with these new ideas, but now almost no space to continue to practice some of the new learning, to implement and to pilot even some of the new technologies that are being adopted, um, obviously from a lot of international sources, um, but were perhaps also being um, created and generated out of existing technology spaces in our particular um, country. But when I flip the question, you know, for a second over back to you, Carl, you know, what technology have you seen um, US-based contractors adopt over the last 12 to 18 months? Um, and do you see a continuation to the addition of technology to those operations? Or do you feel like where the industry is right now, it just feels like just enough and let's just deal with what's going on at the moment? Yes. Yeah, so, so first of all, your passion for this topic clearly comes through. I mean, it, it, it is infectious. It's refreshing. I love it. Construction contractors in New York specifically, but I'll make a general statement about the United States. They tend to shy away from, from the adopting technology because they don't see the immediate return on investment. And again, I think that's more of a, a perspective we need to educate and demonstrate. And I think the, the pandemic gave us the opportunity to do so. You know, most, constru most construction companies had to put their technologies to the test rather quickly during the initial shutdowns. Um, we saw back office employees turning into the curve uh, and learn how to work remotely. Um, IT teams were stretched thin. They had to make sure uh, the VPNs had the bandwidth to accommodate multiple users at once. Um, and and as, we, as we both know, mobile meeting platforms like Zoom, Google Meet, Teams, whatever it is, whatever your cup of tea is in, in that platform, it became the norm, not just for internal meetings, um, but also for how project kickoff meetings were happening. I, I, I've even seen them being used on project walkthroughs to make sure the progress was moving according to plan. So we got, we got creative with it. We used it to the best we could. You know, a number of the initial issues shifting to the virtual work environment have resolved themselves. Um, but I really do believe the contractor can continue to have the opportunity to evaluate their workplace, remote workplace strategies, assess the technologies that are meeting their needs, and continue to explore new ways to build. I mean, a great example here is drones. You know, we were seeing drones being used on job sites in New York City, you know, going 75, 80, 90 stories up in the sky to deliver tools and materials to these hard to reach access points. Um, drones were also great in documenting real-time job site conditions. So if there was a claim because there's a force majeure or a weather condition, let's look at what the drone documented on this day. Oh, yes, we do agree with you, Mr. and Mrs. Contractor. Let's move forward. Um, we're seeing the advent of wearables and other technologies to monitor safety, uh, employee safeties uh, from, from, from gravity-related accidents, trip and fall. But we're also seeing those wearables now um, or we were as we're coming out of the pandemic to make sure that where possible laborers on the job site were socially distanced. We could make sure that they were, they were at six feet apart, you know, and as people continue to collaborate over the web, we're seeing more and more contractors embrace concepts such as augmented reality, virtual reality. Um, and they're using the, the, these tools to look at what a vertical, the new vertical construction could do to a city's skyline or the impact a new vertical construction could have to weather conditions. Um, we're seeing it for project mock-ups to make sure if the vision for an existing structure, it's feasible, um, and to walk through those what-if scenarios. So we're really embracing and seeing some pretty neat stuff with the technology. But we've got to remember, there's certain aspects of construction that can never be virtual. We can't swing hammers from our, from, 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 uh, from our home office, right? We can't build remotely. So as we're allowing some functions of the construction company to be remote, we got to remember there are other functions that can never be remote. So we have to toe this line to make sure that you maintain that one culture, one mentality um, uh, perspective. Now, the downside to all this, and again, I don't need to tell you, Lynette, you, you, you've been involved in this industry uh, uh, a number of years, is that as we continue to increase our reliance on technology, we are creating opportunities for cyber criminals. Um, they love the construction industry. They perceive it as one with a high proliferation of middle market companies 
who might not have the technological sophistication when it comes to investments in technology and protecting that technology. Uh, mixed in times of financial general uncertainty, cyber criminals have had the perfect setup to prey on vulnerable and fearful companies. I've seen offers of free job site COVID tests to COVID-19 financial grants, just list the, the names and social security numbers of all your employees and we'll give you the access to these resources. This is the environment we're in and it's our job to create and promote awareness there. Um, so while the construction industry is a late adopter to cyber and information security protocols, it's never too late to promote awareness throughout the organization in an environment where it's okay to be skeptical of an email or of a new face on a job site or if a vendor is all of a sudden changing their payment process. It's okay to ask the question, is this real? So as we continue to innovate the way the industry builds, um, my, my kind of closing thought here is put an emphasis on that adoption of technology, focus on building healthily and safety. Items that show the contract that keeps the employee top of mind are a quick and easy way to be successful, to attract talent, and, and, and to really be a leader in how we construct the new normal. Um, Lynette, looks like we're kind of coming to the close of our time together. Uh, one last piece of wisdom you want to share with me? Definitely for me, it would be to say that um, for us as participants in the built environment, um, this environment, the sector has been one that has had a lot of stability and security in its systems, its processes, and its fundamentals for not just decades, but centuries. Um, and often at the heart of that has been build it and the people will come whether it was transport, it was retail, it was housing, it was commercial, industrial, all the different asset classes that we've had. What this pandemic has specifically um, shown us, however, is that the world has going back to very much a human to human um, and a consumer centric model and source. And so we've really got to not just listen to our um, intuition around location theory. We've really not just got to listen to what's happening in capital markets. We've really not just got to listen to our experience and our intuitive guts about what the next trend will be. But we've also got to open ourselves to what these human factors, um, you know, where do people want to work, wants to live, wants to play, wants to learn, where do they want to do so safely? How do they want to move in a way that accommodates all of these new dynamics in the world that we find ourselves in today? And how can we be enablers of a world um, that, um, it, or rather of a new world order and a model that accommodates that safety, that security, that comfort, and that capability in our societies using um, construction and infrastructure. So it's gonna force us to listen differently. It's gonna force us to hear messages perhaps we're not ready for, but it's also going to force us to really sit down and um, pick on our why. And once we've picked on our why and we've clarified that in response to where we find ourselves. I think a lot of us as participants in the sector are going to then quickly um, recalibrate on how we're going to do it, um, how quickly we're going to get there, who we're going to do it with um, and at what pace um, and at what rate we're going to be able to be those agents um, of change. So that for me is really my parting shot is we've got to listen now to different sources that guide our decisions. Well, in a period of time where I think we turned into the curve, innovated and dropped the words, I can't um, pr pretty quickly and efficiently. I think the, uh, the future is very bright for the industry. Um, globally, um, and we have a, an amazing opportunity to continue to advise the industries we, as we reinvent how we build and how we construct the new normal. Um, thank you, Lynette. Uh, I enjoyed this. this. This was refreshing. It was, it was a great conversation. Um, thank you to More Global for putting this on. Um, and I wish everyone continued good health. Thank you so much for the time and, and, and uh, the attention.
Yeah, thank you so much, Carl. Um, such a wonderful exchange of ideas and comparison of what's happening in our different geographies. And I certainly hope that everybody who gets to watch this, um, you know, comes away with something that they can go and contextually apply or think about um, in the region they find themselves in. And thank you so much to the Moore Global team for hosting us.